This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad yourself. Doing pretty good, man. I feel like I've been the road warrior. I really haven't traveled between June and about a week ago, but now it's two weeks in a row, about to be three weeks in a row. We're doing authenticated conference on Monday. I'm sitting here in a hotel airport or airport hotel in Calgary, Canada. Um, had a great week here. It's a beautiful country, beautiful people. Um, everyone's been like so friendly, which I mean, I, I don't even want to say that in the United States, people aren't just friendly. <laughs> that would, that's not well, what Canadians are say. famous for their friendliness. I think, I think that's kind of a known thing. It's, it's definitely, it's definitely how I felt since I've been here. Like that's, that's got some truth to it, but, um, yeah, living out of suitcases is not all glamour. Three whole weeks. That's rookie numbers, baby. I'm on like week seven, about to be eight and going on to like 12. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm doing is though contiguous weeks, like including mm-hmm. the weekend. So yeah. I left on the first. I'll get home on the 19th. And what I think is, here's the way I was looking at it. Like I finish up... Um, so I was here in Canada working on a workshop. It ended yesterday. And so I had the choice to, you know, fly out tomorrow morning, go back to Atlanta, um, and then have to go out to San Diego on Sunday. So basically have just like one full day at home or just go to San Diego early and get there, go to the pool. And hopefully they've got like a tiki bar that makes um, pina coladas that, you know, will keep me happy. I think he chose wisely. I ha- I had to come home because I literally had to just restock my entire suitcase. <laughs> I've been gone all week as well, Sunday through Friday. So today is October 13th. It's 11 p.m. Eastern time. This is how you and I roll, trying to get something out for next Monday, which would be what, the 14th, 15th, 16th, first day of Authenticate. This this show is actually going to compete with us because <laughs> we're yeah. being the, probably in the middle of a keynote uh, doing a live show at Authenticate. But um, I had to come home. I needed a day to like reload my suitcase for yet another full week of travel. Um, see my dogs. My wife's out of time. She's traveling, so like coordinating. She drove to the airport, left my car there. I got home a couple hours ago, picked up the car, went home, and then I'm going to come back uh, early Sunday morning drop my car off there and then she's going to pick up the car on Monday on the way back. <laughs> so, so like, we're doing this whole shuffle home, game. <laughs> when you get home, the dogs who bonkers, right? Uh, two of them did. The third one acknowledged my existence. Definitely my wife's dog, uh, our newest puppy. Um, he was happy. I let him out of his crate. Um, and then it was like immediately dashed around the house looking to see where mom was. And I was very <laughs> disappointed that it was just me, <laughs> but the other two were happy to see me. Yeah, no, I mean, like, if, if your dogs aren't happy to see you after you've been gone for a week, then you're not a good person. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Dogs are the best people. I'm a big dog fan. I think people who have dogs know it and get it. It's like, they're always happy to see you when you come home. Yeah, no, I mean, I love dogs. And the only reason I don't have a dog is because, I mean, I travel not mm-hmm. nearly as much as you, Jeff, but don't have anybody at home who I could, you know, count on taking care of a dog and cleaning up after the dog and feeding the dog. So, um, yeah, I mean, checking a dog into a kennel every week is not, not very fair. Yeah. No, that's not cool. Yeah. We don't do that either. So I get it. I, get, I totally get it. Yeah. Um, so, so you- um, I've been busy. I mean, you know, not this week, but last week was the octane conference in San Francisco. How was and, that? Well, well, first let me just comment San Francisco I love San Francisco. I've been the biggest San Francisco fan for a long time. And, you know, I think that there's been some things over the years that, um, you know, have kind of put certain parts of it in decline. But I was talking about the Moscone Center, and they've really done a lot to, you know, kind of have a police presence. So for me, anyway, I felt very safe, you know, walking around that area and walking from the hotel to 
the center. So drastic improvement, I think, even from last year. Um, but the, the most remarkable thing was it was 90 degrees in the city of San Francisco in October. I don't that's think hot. I've ever been in San Francisco and it was 90 <laughs> degrees before. And I've yeah, been that's there a lot of times. Especially for being on the Bay, it's generally a little bit cooler compared to the rest, which is why I like it so much. <laughs> yeah, they have those microclimates out there. But what it, so like in the East Bay, Oakland, it could be 90, 95 degrees. And in downtown San Francisco, it could be 55 degrees. Or on the Bay, it could be like, you know, freezing and windy. It was not windy. And it was definitely not cold. And so I was expecting to have to wear a jacket. But, you know, as I was walking around with a jacket, I was like breaking a sweat. Yeah, that's that's not my jam. I'm glad I was in D.C. that week. <laughs> <laughs> it was hot there, but I, don't know, I was inside pretty much the entire time in a convention center um, doing stuff like that. So you were at Octane. I was at Identity Week America. It sounds like we both had a good time. I know I had a good time. We recorded a couple episodes. I actually recorded three episodes while I was out there. Um, I just had a time. Opinion. I mean, yeah. you know, first off, like the energy level at Octane was off the charts. And so I had an opportunity to sit with a lot of folks and record, you know, interviews. Well, I'm going to get those uploaded. You're going to piece them all together into some kind of. <laughs> I'm going to try to. I'm curious to see what you actually did. I, you sent me a text with some with kind of one of the interviews. And I was like, all right, this is not actually too bad. So we'll see what the final product turns out. My expectation is that was the worst of, of the bunch because I was kind of figuring out more as I was going along. So I um, heard you got Daniel on camera, too. I did get Daniel. We've been trying to get Daniel on the show. He's he's our boss. <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and he's been he's elusive. <laughs> he did a really good job. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> I You know, the one thing that he did was so I had these lavalier microphones and he, you know, it's like he was leaving to go to the airport and he like he had my lavalier mic on and I didn't realize it until like two, three minutes later. And I got my next guest coming in a few minutes. I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like texting him. He's not answering. And then I try and call him. It goes to voicemail. I'm like, what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. Am I basically going to have to take my, my one remaining lavalier mic and pass it back and forth? Fortunately, they called me back and brought back the, the microphone. So it all worked out. But you know, the conference was super high energy. Um, you know, one of the, they had a, a few big announcements. The biggest announcement was kind of like all around bringing AI into the product and how it's going to manifest. And so one of those was um, what they're calling ITP, identity threat protection. And essentially it's, you know, using the AI lever to AI, um, leveraging the AI technology to, you know, work with this big data that they're collecting to, you know, recognize patterns. So applying a model to recognize patterns, that would be something that would say you want to then trigger an action like disable that account. Then they've got some other features that are rolling out, which sound less impressive, but when it all plugs together, it makes sense. Like I mean, big announcement about single logout, which I think is a little bit proprietary, but if you think about it, it's like, if you realize like, oh, Jeff's account's been compromised, maybe someone saw his session cookie and is now, you know, logged in and trying to do bad things to Sam. Maybe he clicked on a phishing email, et cetera. We can not only disable his account, but close all the sessions that are open in other applications. And that's a really big deal because, you know, I mean, even a client that I, I'm currently working with, I've I found out that, you know, they leave really long session timeouts. And that's one of the, the biggest forms of, um, you know, hijacking a, a person's, you know, they're not stealing their credentials, but they get these session cookies mm-hmm. and can bypass MFA and get logged in as that person. So if that session is a timed out, now if you're giving 30 days, 60 days, 180 days for that session to live, I think that's the maximum in in Okta anyway. Um, but think about that. Someone could take that session and that cookie could be that old. They could use it to get in. So overall, like really like that was something I think every one of the folk, every one of the people there was like really excited about. Cause when you think about the current capabilities within the tool, it's kind of a black box. 
and you don't know what it's doing. Uh, this is looks like it's going to be much more exposed so that people have some levers and can kind of see how it's making the decisions and what decisions are being made. Yeah, I think you need to be able to look, tune it somehow. Authentication is kind of a very tricky thing, I think, especially when you're trying to fingerprint essentially what is a valid authentication session versus not valid, considering the number of devices and locations and times of days and things like that. So it'll be interesting. I, I feel a little bit vindicated that you said AI at Okta because there was definitely a theme at SailPoint Navigate this week, AI being injected into the SailPoint product as well. Um, I feel like I called this a couple months back. Or, I'm sure they were working on it before that, but I'm going to take credit anyway. Um, AI seems credit to be, for AI. I'm taking credit for all AI, good or bad. Bring it on. Um, <laughs> no, I just think that you know it's a natural evolution, right, of the identity products and large language models are sort of the uh, AI du jour, and they're graduating from historically AI being machine machine learning or pattern matching and things like that to oh now you can actually talk in quotation marks, right? Type to the AI to ask a specific questions, generate reports, um, help with configurations of applications, things like that. Um, Microsoft is certainly getting the game with things like Copilot, but AI was a big focus as well at, um, at the SailPoint Navigate conference, which is where I was all week. I think a conference, a, a vendor specific conference where they didn't talk about AI in their product would be a major miss at this point. Yeah, it's like zero trust in the last couple of years. If your product didn't have zero trust in it, uh, you were you were pretty much done for. <laughs> yeah. Now it's and now everything's AI. So I, w- I wonder if this was the same thing at SailPoint, but at at Okta, they kind of laid out their roadmap both on the uh, the customer cloud as well as the workforce cloud. There's a lot of new functionality that they're promising. I mean, really on the on the um, workforce side it's like that converged identity so it's access management which they're already kind of like top dog um there's iga privilege access management cloud infrastructure entitlement management it's like the way i see it like for them to be successful in that they have two choices one is to go out and buy somebody for each one of those things the other is spend a lot of money on r d but the last thing, the, the thing that I want to make sure, that, like, hopefully they don't do is they just talk about these things and roll out, like, not a very good version of it because I think that would kind of stain the, the brand because, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you have to, if you're going to say we're going to have something, you got to have it. Yeah. I think that that convergence is another word that came up as well. Now we're starting to see the rise of platforms. Okta, you know, Okta is creating one. SailPoint definitely is creating one. This this idea of converged identity, or you know, whatever you want to call it, unified identity platforms, right? things like that, kind of brings me back to the old days of Oracle <laughs> and IBM and, and CA, where that was platforms. And then it became best of breed, and then yeah. guess what? We're back to bell bottoms again. You know, I hit back to bell bottoms. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't think those. Things like Oracle CA are deserving of the term platform. I think they're suites. They're just a bunch of products that they put under the umbrella. And I hope that's not what Okta, SailPoint, and all these others do. I hope they build a platform. To me, a platform is something that has some open, like an openness factor to it so that entrepreneurs can go out and build add ons to that platform. And so they create almost like a an opportunity, like a business model, like build your business around our platform. I think Salesforce has done that. I, I think some social media platforms have done that. So ServiceNow. Yeah. What's that? ServiceNow is another one. ServiceNow is exactly, exactly, to me, that's a platform. Um, and I think just saying like, oh, you know, we're going to be a closed platform. I think that almost disqualifies you from the term platform. Well, good news. Uh, SailPoint is not going to be a closed platform, at least not in the future. They did mention sometime in the next couple of years allowing people to develop like basically like plugins. It's almost like they're creating the browser and they're going to have some sort of browser plugin architecture that lets you do different things with the data that's in there. Very API heavy, meaning which is a good thing. I think you can do a lot with the APIs that are out there. So it'll be interesting to see kind of what happens. Um, 
you know, with the sale point platform, because that's to me where they're, where they're headed and what they were kind of talking about all week. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, again, IGA is like a great starting point to build an identity platform from, because I really think that IGA, all the kind of like core identity technologies is, truly has its arms around identity or it's the closest thing. Um, I think when you look at your authentication system, they're calling it like, oh, it's an identity. It's identity as a service. But I think it's almost like accounts as a service. Like those yeah. are accounts. Like you can have multiple accounts for signing on, but you still just have one identity. Well, I think here. IGA is the hardest thing to do in identity, to do it well, I mean. Like, I think that's the one that has the most complexity involved with it. And there aren't really standards if you think about it from an IGA perspective. Yes, there's like common things like onboarding and offboarding and access reviews and access requests. But other than skim, there really isn't like a standard to do any of that stuff. On the authentication side, you've got OAuth, you've got SAML, you got OpenID Connect, right? Stuff like that. Um, and it's very, it's a very specific path you follow. Okay, I need to authenticate. And then once I authenticate, then I can get to this thing with an authorization. IGA throws in a whole bunch of complexities in there, especially from a business rules perspective. So I feel like if I were to build an identity product, I would start with IGA, lock that down, and then try to expand from there. The problem with that approach, though, ends up being, well, everybody's already solved the authentication problem. So now... Yeah, is it easier to get in from a sales perspective if I'm trying to sell this product if everyone's already using a different authentication platform and trying to migrate people off of that? Do you I don't think, have the answer. But it's think, interesting to see how Okta and SailPoint have gone different directions with it. Or approached it, I should say, from different directions. How did you used to think of Active Directory? Not talking Azure Active Directory. Did you think of it as an identity system or as... Like, I, I had one uh, coworker in the past who used to call it. He's like, it's just a network operating system. And we thought that's a bit more than just a network operating system. It's also an authentication system. And but I don't think those are, it, it's an identity system. Yeah. And I kind of look at Azure AD and I'm like, okay, it's got a lot of similarity from that perspective. It's, is it really tracking the identity? But now there's, you know, they're starting to expand into, are you pulling it from the HR system, but are they correlating all the accounts to that identity? Because ultimately it's like, hey, when Jeff separates from the organization, are we shutting off all the accounts that he has access to? That's really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. I used to, I mean, for me, AD and the role that I've had when I've been around AD closest was it was authentication and authorization. That was pretty much it. Yes, yeah. it's backbone for other things within Windows Server. But for me, as an identity person, it's authentication and it's authorization. I think that I feel the same way. I think that tactically speaking, though, the folks who run AD in organizations have wound up becoming so central to how identity is handled within the organization. This is the tool that I know, I love, and it's our identity system. And we're going to plug Azure AD on top of it, which I guess is not even the, the current term for it. And Entra. that's what we do for identity. So we don't mm -hmm. need an IGA. We don't need any external third-party systems. We don't need I don't know if I agree with that. Magic because Azure gives us privilege access management. Well, I, to, to some degree, I think it's... You know, if we start talking about now we're back to platforms, right? Microsoft has their own platform too. And it's good at Microsoft things. But once you get outside of Microsoft things, it's not so great. With the exception of authentication. They've definitely embraced standards like OAuth and OpenID Connect and so forth, right? To do authentication. But I'm not going to do a SAP access review with Microsoft Entra. That would be crazy. <laughs> but they're so good at marketing, it sounds like almost like you could and you should. <laughs> it's interesting you bring up that SAP access reviews because I was working with a client this week to develop an IGA strategy. And so, of course, they 
are in the throes of deploying SAP for HR and for their ERP. That's going to be a big bang. And, you know, fortunately from my perspective, you know, their IGA roadmap really won't, or their IGA platform won't go in until after that ERP is in place and should have time to be settled. Um, but as always, you're kind of faced with the question of, okay, do we need to do GRC? And then the question is, can GRC or SAP identity manager do everything? And that could be our IGA or reverse it. Can we have some IGA and manage all the, the rules and, um, everything down to the entitlement level <clears throat> and do access reviews and access provisioning from the IJ to SAP. I mean, there's the philosophically, can it be done is one question, but I think more importantly, it's like, do you want to do that? And I feel like, you know, for that latter one the answer is heck no. I also think it's heck no for, you want to take the SAP piece and try and make that your enterprise IGA. Just my experience with seeing this one, I'm a little dated. I know some of the tools have come a little bit further, but you know, there's no way that they have caught up with some of the major IGA platforms out there. Yeah. SAP still gives me nightmares. <laughs> when I used to have to manage that from an identity perspective. Not a fan. Um, but yeah, run into this question a lot with us as, 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 for whatever reason between SAP and between every other IGA platform. If an organization has SAP, they probably have SAP GRC and it's really good at that specific task. And it gets less good. The further you go away from that task, do some basic things, you know, windows active directory. That's kind of a no brainer. Everybody can do active directory. That's not hard. <laughs> um, but is the interface up to snuff? You know, does it have all the business rules and logic that you want to be able to configure in it versus customization? I, know, I feel like this is why IGA is so hard is because it's hard to have a one size fits all, especially when you start dealing with apps like SAP or Dynamics or Oracle or any other, you know, large ERP type type implementation. Yeah, I've been I've been in IT for like roughly 25 years. And when I've seen failures happen in IT, it's been ERP deployments, it's been IEM deployments, and maybe CRM. But CRM is, is mostly, they didn't do a good job with the data, so put that off to the side. You're talking about ERP and IEM. Like, that's where the big failures happen. Here's my feeling for, my advice for IEM practitioners out there. If an ERP platform is being replaced or being launched like don't set yourself up to be the reason that it fails because <laughs> those projects are pretty damn expensive the reason i am projects usually fail is the same thing they get tied into too many business critical applications and then for whatever reason they don't operate and the business critical ap applications can't do their job because of your iam system don't let that happen don't be that person <laughs> yeah don't be that guy <laughs> don't be that guy um so we got another conference we're going to in a couple of days authenticate i feel like this is everybody decided apparently october was conference month between octane identity week america sailpoint navigate i'm sure there was probably a gartner thing that took place and now you and i are headed to san Fran no san diego i don't know where i'm going carlsbad anymore. yeah carlsbad just north of the city of san diego to do a few things at authenticate we're going to do a keynote live show which i'm a little nervous about we haven't done anything like that before um have well, here's one thing in. i was thinking yeah yeah so i had a reflection on this today i'm like i don't know that we've ever had that many people listen to one of our podcasts at one time is you know there could be four yeah, or five hundred people in the room different times yeah just as many people could yeah other people listen at different times so i think we're gonna set a new record on monday yeah, I think uh, I think it'll turn out well. I'm kind of ex I'm nervously excited for it. Um, the idea is that we're going to do a live show on stage. It's going to be very similar to this format. You and I are going to they're going to play our you know our intro you know jingle, and 
you and I are going to come up on the stage. We're going to sit down. It's supposed to look like we're recording something. I'm not sure how that's going to look, but we'll do it live. <laughs> um, you and I are going to have our normal sort of upfront banter. Uh, it was specifically requested that we do banter. So oh, <laughs> we'll, really? we'll have some of that. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll introduce uh, our guests. We're gonna, obviously, we're going to talk about FIDO authentication, pass keys, things like that. And we've got uh, a few people that have been scheduled and maybe a surprise guest. We'll see. Uh, but we'll have um, product managers basically from TikTok, Google, and eBay that are going to come up and sort of join the show as sort of like a group interview live, you know, live show. And we'll, you know, run through our normal kind of questions and things like that. And we are going to, I'm even thinking like, what are we going to do for a lighter note? So I've got some good ideas on how we're going to end the show with, you know, shenanigans and hijinks and just fun stuff that I like to do at the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, that's what makes it fun for people. Like we always want the podcast to be educational and entertaining. So, you know, that's usually the entertaining part. Uh, but we're also at the conference going to be recording some individual podcasts that will drop over the next two weeks, I think. Uh, so day one, we're recording for the second time with David Motti from Transmit Security. He's like the the Cheeto Chief Identity Officer. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's going to be talking to us about his... Everybody's talking about their um, what they're presenting, but then, of course, we'll go off on all the side trails to make it even... Us? No, we never... We would never, we never do that. Do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what me complain? Um, so yeah, David will be talking about machine identities, which I think is a huge topic. Well, Stephanie Shucker on. So Stephanie was presented to us as the premier biometrics expert in the world, and we talked to her for what was it a half hour, Jeff? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> I don't know all the biometrics uh, experts in the world, but she probably gets you know gets that award. Best biometric person on the best identity podcast in the world. Bam. Take that. Bam. We got Pam Dingle on. I mean, everybody knows who Pam is with Microsoft. Um, yeah, I, I think there's so much that we can talk about that we have to make sure that we get to the the, the top issues. And, and primarily, we want to give her some time to talk about like what she's presenting on because it's top of mind for her. Uh, we're going to have Pedro Martinez on from Talos Group. Pagers there talking about pass keys in financial services, but I think he's going to talk more broadly than just financial services. And um, so we'll get that perspective because I think he's the only person we're talking to specifically about pass keys. And I think, you know, at this point, that's the, that's the major theme for FIDO Alliance. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe it'll be AI. <laughs> I'm sure it'll come we'll up. Find, and then I'll we find a Ori way to weave that into our keynote is, is something about AI. <laughs> yeah. And then we have Ori Eisen from uh, TrueSone, and he's going to be talking to Password List. So I'm excited about that conversation as well. I mean, Password List for me is like, you know, that was like last year's buzz. Um, I feel like we've made some progress. I was thinking this past year was going to be the year of Password List. I don't know that I can say that like, that's what it was. Maybe we'll look back on it and we will see that. I think that's a big thing I want to see to think. What are the customer success stories that tie back to pass through lists? There were some good ones last year. Let's see, or they, is it becoming even more mainstream? Well, I think it has to start somewhere. The technology is there now, and we've got basic interoperability between devices and platforms and OSs, right? Um, I think... I think this last year will be the beginning of that wave that we, th that we thought would be coming sooner, but Hey, better late than never. Um, I'm excited to see it. I'm, I'm excited to see more pass keys options popping up when I'm signing into things. Uh, Google actually, I think it was this week, earlier this week, they announced pass keys by default for every user. Now I'm I mean, using that's, it. that's a big it's step. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, okay. It's, uh, 11.30 p.m. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not here. It's only 9.30. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, next week. I'm kind of bummed that I'm only going to be there a couple days. I have to like take a super early flight Wednesday morning to get to Indianapolis. So while you're still sunning yourself in California, I'm headed to Indianapolis for a, another conference, a government-focused thing in, in, in Indiana. So um, that'll be fun, I guess. <laughs> um, 
I'll see my friend Andrew. So that's good. We'll have a good time. I'm sure the two of us um, talking government and identity and things like that. So leaving early Wednesday morning, does that mean you're not going to partake in any of the social hour activities? It's Tuesday unlikely. Night? I think my flight's at like 6 a.m. or something Ooh. like that on, on Wednesday. So I'm going to be like in recording and then basically like pack up my stuff, go to sleep and be out of the, be out of there. <laughs> I'll really drink all of your alcohol then. Oh, thank you for making that sacrifice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> appreciate that. Um, you want to end on a later note? Yeah, let's do that. You had you had an idea when we talked about it. And I have a follow-up if, if we have time and we, and we think okay. about it again. What was yours? Okay, so mine was, what is the best? I'm, and I'm going to spring this on you. What was the best and worst airports you've been to? Okay. Well, the best one that I've been to would probably be Canada airport in Japan. Um, and now it's only, it's been probably like 10 years since I was there. Uh, maybe seven, but um, just a super nice airport, super clean, very impressive kind of walking in and having like these just high architecture ceilings and trees and the infamous Hello Kitty store that I felt with, had to sleep on a bench on outside <laughs> because uh, thanks to United, I missed my connecting flight into the Philippines. So but even still, I think that was probably the nicest airport that I've been at. Um, worst airport. It's kind of hard to. That's kind of to say because every port, every airport can totally suck if you like <laughs> have a bad experience in it. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that because I feel like it could be any airport. So let me remind you of one. So we were in Connecticut. I think it was um, Sanford, Connecticut. And it was like a bus station. He got, and it was like, there was like nowhere to sit, no outlets to plug into. That one was pretty bad. Um, yeah, I, can see I think that. LaGuardia in New York is really bad. Oh, it used to be bad, but it's actually nice now. At least the is United it nice now? Yeah, it's really nice. I mean, it's a great turnaround. I mean, it's kind of what you want to see. But I remember being in LaGuardia once and I was sitting in one of the terminals and there was like a... It, to call it a leak would not be fair to leaks. This was like just an open water faucet coming through the ceiling into the middle of the concourse. And I was like, yep, everything I'd heard about LaGuardia was instantly true. <laughs> I saw that, but they have turned it around. They've got new construction there. It's actually quite nice now. I think one of the things is really annoying. If you want to go from like one terminal to the next ship to get on the bus, and it's like, yeah. It feels like you're driving for like 10 minutes to get to the server world. That's probably, you know, a hundred yards away. Chicago's like that right now, O'Hare, because uh, first of all, they had like the train, the people mover, the tram monorail type thing was down for like four years. <laughs> and then now that's the only way you can get between some of the different, some of the terminals because they're doing construction everywhere. Um, yeah. O'Hare is, is a real pain right now trying to move between terminals. It's just not fun. Yeah. So I'm going to surprise with my answer. But my favorite airport is Detroit. That is a nice airport. It's a nice airport. Yep. Minneapolis isn't too bad. Like the, that shopping mall that they have in the middle is pretty nice. But I mean, getting from one end to the other is a real pain in the neck. So I'm not a big Minneapolis airport fan. I'm also not a Charlotte airport fan. I think people think, oh, it's so quaint. The middle area's got these rocking chairs and stuff. But if you get dropped, and like E and you've got to get to the other end of C or something like it could be like a half hour walk. It's, <laughs> it's not what it's not good when you have a tight connection because then you start running and then you get the, to the gate and like your plane's already taken off. So yeah, I'm not a big Charlotte fan. I'm going to go with Detroit is the best. I also have to give honorable mention to, you know, and I haven't done a ton of um, international travel, but the airport in Amsterdam, I think it's called Schiphol. Schiphol? I don't know. Never oh, been. Man, it's, I, I don't like it. And I, I don't know if like all the European airports are like this, but it's like there's like a waiting room concept for each gate. And you go through the security. Or they check your ticket and check your passport. And then you go and you like sit there and wait for them to board the plane. So like the the common area is almost like, I think it's almost like public. It's been a really long while since I've been there, but I hated that airport. 
<laughs> like I said, any airport can be bad if you think about it hard enough or if you have a, a disastrous event in an airport. Um, I thought of something as a follow up lighter note, and I'm going to this is a challenge that I'm pretty sure I'm going to win. What's the best thing, best meal that you had this week? Oh, um, I had some pretty good ones, man. We had sushi last night that was pretty out of this world. Um, very expensive. Fortunately, it's not on my not on my expense report. <laughs> <laughs> uh so i had i went out to dinner with uh our good friend daniel we went oh, to a well, chef's tasting I mean, that's always yeah <laughs> when daniel's ordering i mean you're gonna get the best of the best well we went to a place uh just that he and i and we had a chef's tasting and let me let me just read the menu to you because this is what we had in one sitting um and different courses first course was corn carrot and radish sort of a tasting menu type thing. Corn with pine nut, uh, pine nut, carrot with hay, which is kind of interesting, radish with uh, rose. Then we followed that up with oyster and a preserved mustard, surf clam and a fermented black bean, hamachi and black vinegar, jellyfish with Thai basil, and a smoked trout roe with seaweed. Hamachi is um, what, eel? Uh, I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> because I stepped way out of my comfort zone for this dinner. <laughs> this is sushi, um, so right? yeah. I mean, I, 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 I had oyster. I had surf clam. I had hamachi, jellyfish, trout. I mean, these are things that I would. You normally had jellyfish. Not eat. Yeah, jellyfish with Thai basil. I, I've never eaten jellyfish. Okay. What was well, it I have, like? Uh, I don't remember. Just sting on the way down. Wine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, then we had uh, crab with saffron and ginkgo. Um, that's when things started to take a turn for the better because I'm not really of the sea. We then went to a rabbit soup dumpling with blueberry vinegar and antelope tartare with apple. And then a chicken wing that was stuffed with cordyceps. I'm not a mushrooms person, but I could. that was actually not bad. A black truffle consomme with pecan tofu and then capped off on the savory side with a spiced goat leg with scallion and sesame. For dessert, we had um, it was like a basil ice cream type thing with melon and I think it was cantaloupe, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure. And then a sweet potato cereal with toasted milk. That sounds really great. Yeah, I mean, like, Daniel's like amazing. He's like, you stepped out of your cup to the like, no, no, no. I leaped out of my comfort zone with that meal. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> that did, wasn't even did, close. <laughs> did you leave there and go and get like McDonald's or anything? No, I, that was it. That's all I had. In fact, that's, I don't think I actually ate anything the rest of, for that day. So that was kind of like everything all in once. Because I was you like, I should have told stuff. you as the answer to your question. Like, I had the chicken sandwich at Popeyes today. And <laughs> hey, that's good too. Hey, <laughs> teach their own. <laughs> Whoa, is that good? I'll That's do Taco Bell. I'm not fancy. I don't, I don't discriminate. I'll eat anything for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> Any fast food, I should say. But this was definitely a meal that was like way outside my comfort zone. So I'm kind of glad I tried it. Jellyfish, and, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's serious stuff right there. Yeah. Hey, it started off a little bit rough because I was it was that oyster with mustard shooter, two things I don't really like. I love oysters. And I tried it. And I like coughed right away, and Dan just starts laughing at me. That that was literally the first course <laughs> type thing that came out. Yeah. And I was like, "Oh, this is going to be a long the antelope." <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but it was good. The best part, the meal though, wasn't the food. It was the food was actually really good. It's a place called a, um, Apartment One Fifteen in Austin, um, a little bit off of downtown, not too far away, but it was it was kind of a cool spot. Was the chef who kind of prepared everything would come out. And he provided facts about what he was giving you in a very mm. short, I would say, an unfriendly way. <laughs> it was just like, here's this, take it in one bite, enjoy. And then you just walk away. <laughs> and we were having a good time with that. And our server was super, you know, friendly and knowledgeable. And everyone there was, it was actually pretty great. But we were getting a kick out of like the chef coming over and just not being Mr. Personality. <laughs> I've heard um, when you have like a sushi chef, like, they put the amount of soy sauce on it that you're supposed to have. So if you like, you used to go into a sushi place and like dipping your, you know, the soy, like that's not how you do it. It's like the 
three Michelin star yeah. sushi places. You got to taste your food before you decide to add more seasoning. I think that's a very American thing is like, oh, you get the food and then it's like you just throw throwing salt and ketchup on it without even having tried it yet. Um, <laughs> that's a cardinal rule of eating. You should not be doing that. Taste the food first. Then if you need to add things to it, do it. It's the cardinal rule, but it's like I already know I want ketchup on my french fries. <laughs> yes. But as a side. I'm I'm not, I'm less I'm more I'm more like thinking of like throwing ketchup on your steak, right? Or things like that, or adding salt before you've even tried it. I mean yeah. that's that's bad. Ketchup on your steak. Oh my goodness. Yeah, who would do that? Only lunatics would. Um <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's go ahead and wrap it up uh before I turn into a pumpkin. Um so yeah, this is gonna go out Monday in a couple days. We're sort of competing with our keynote, but hey, that is kinda cool for people who aren't watching our keynote. Maybe they're listening to this. And um, what else? We're Anything told else? we'll get a recording of the keynote, so we'll yeah. be able to publish that. Our plan is to publish that as like the capstone of all of the recordings we do next week. So look forward yeah. to that. Man, if we don't think- get that recording, I'm going to be kind of ticked <laughs> off. Yeah, I'm, I have faith and confidence. I think I think we'll get that. Um, I just don't know when I'm going to have time to pull it all together because I'm going to be traveling so much over the, again the next few weeks. So it'll probably be an interesting release schedule, but here we are you know, almost midnight, just trying to get something out for Monday to keep the streak alive. And we, and we're going to do it. I'll definitely get, be able to get this edited out in time. And then, uh, we'll, fi- we'll figure out the authenticate release schedule from there. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, I listened to the episode with you, Ian and Hutch. I thought that's one that everybody <laughs> should listen to. That was hilarious. Got into the D and D conversation. You got into the, um, the alarm thing. And I'm telling you, like in San Francisco, it's like, I was the only one who knew this thing was going to happen. No one seemed mm-hmm. to care. <laughs> that was a fun conversation. I know. I just have a good time. Every time Ian's on, he's great. First time I've been able to meet Hutch. He was great too. Um, yeah. That was just, you know, just three dudes sitting in, the, in a back room talking <laughs> pretty much. He, I'm telling you, man, Ian could be like a stand up comedian. He's a funny, yeah. he's got a quick wit. Yeah. That's why he's that's why he's who he is. He's doing these keynotes and all kinds of stuff. That's true. All right, let's wrap it up. Um, you can find us on the web, idacpodcast.com, on Twitter or X or whatever we call it, IDAC Podcasts, Mastodon at IDAC Podcasts at Infosec.exchange. We have our new LinkedIn page that I have yet to really promote, but I've been subtly like tagging it and all of the recent LinkedIn posts, whenever I post something, you know, a new episode or whatever it is, and we've got some followers there. So subscribe, like share with friends for the folks who came up to me at navigate people like Patrick, uh, Edvin, Matthew. Uh, there were a couple guys from Sweden that I met. I, I think one of them was name was Marcus. I can't remember. Sorry. <laughs> um, but the people who came up and, and introduced themselves was very cool. I handed out some stickers, so you'll be happy to know that there are more stickers in the wild. Thumbs up from Jim. Um, but yeah, that's that's why we do this is just to have conversations about identity like we do here and hopefully share with the world. Anything else, Jim? No, oh, man. Sleep time. Yeah, sleep time. And then just in time for my dog to start uh, chewing his pet, his uh, little Nyla bone thing here. So <laughs> we'll wrap it up. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we'll talk with you all in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com and find us on Twitter at IDAC Podcast. See you next time on Identity at the Center.